Um, let me just, can you hear me? Um, how lovely to be, to, to be back here in Oxford and back in this union. I have thought about you all a bit recently, um, not least because last week, almost a week ago, I had to make what they call a maiden speech in the House of Lords. Right, this is pure Harry Potter. And it was an incredibly nerve-wracking thing to do, um, to stand up in this extraordinary wood-panelled room that has all this iconography and, and in this political moment, in our country, on our continent, in our world. I was so nervous and I got up and I, just, I think I just about got through it. And I thought, how did I get through that? Because I didn't um, go to many wood-panelled places before that one, if I can put it like that. But actually, this is one of the wood-panelled places that I have been to in my life before. And like you, I have had the privilege to engage in debates over many years on difficult, divisive questions in an environment of relative safety and civility. And it gives you, whatever the challenge is, it gives you a kind of confidence and a kind of security that so many people all over the world do not have. And that is a privilege that we share. Now, I didn't study in Oxford, but I came here to speak in debates from pretty much the beginning of my career as a human rights campaigner, because previous generations of Oxford Union members and students decided that human rights were an interesting topic. And so, over the years, I have often sat, usually over there for some reason, but maybe I sometimes sat over there, and had the challenge and the insecurity, but ultimately the safety that we all enjoy tonight, and the privilege, no matter where we began. And that opportunity and that consensus and that civility is currently under threat in our country, on our continent, in our world. And if I'm honest, I think that it's my generation that hasn't delivered so well, and it's your generation that's going to do better. And all I want to really say by way of opening is sorry and solidarity and, and good luck. Thank you very much, Shami. Um, you mentioned speaking here, and you spoke here about exactly a year ago. You spoke in a debate about civil liberties um, sort of ruining the Snoopers Charter, which a few weeks ago you abstained from its passage through Parliament. Um, have your views changed radically since that time? Or has politics sort of given you new perspectives? No, no, I, I haven't changed my mind about the dangers of surveillance at all. It's just that there are certain protocols about being a, a, a about entering Parliament and when you're allowed to speak and when you're not allowed to speak. And um, no, I, mean, I, I have huge concerns about the um, about the Snoopers ch Charter. And it, and it goes beyond that, actually. It's, it, it's kind of bigger than that now. Um, surveillance is not just about um, Britain or America. It, the internet is an international thing, and um, it doesn't respect international borders or the private public sector divide. I campaigned as a civil liberties activist against things like identity cards. And in the end, we won. Well done. And what do I do now? In my bag, I've got a little iPhone, which I pay for, which is probably more intrusive on me and the people connected with me than the ID card that I campaigned against. So this is huge. But it's not just about one bill. It is, it is not just about one country. It's not just about one sector. It is about finding a new, a new ethics and a new activism for this technology and this political moment 
um, that is almost out of con almost out of control. I put it like that. So fo focusing on it in this country, are you saying that there was no way in which you could have made a more vociferous opposition um, to the Snoopers Bill? Uh, it's, it's no, I, look, I, I, everybody does what they can in the conditions that they find themselves. Everyone does what they can. What the, uh, I suppose, in a way, the biggest thing that I have done um, in recent months is to, is to take sides politically. I, I lived my adult life as a cross-party, non-party human rights activist. And then, post the Brexit, I, I took sides. And, and, you know, that's going to upset some people, and I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I don't think that people should be forced to, to take sides very often. But in this particular moment in Britain and in Europe, and beyond, a lot of people are being forced. To, so, so in relation to in relation to the Snoopers Charter, there are there are protocols about when one is allowed to to speak as a new peer. You have protocols in in this chamber too. There are protocols about when you are allowed to speak, and there's also just your your physical capacity and what you're coping with at the time. But everybody knows it's all over the public record what I think about mass surveillance of people, whether it's by the state or the private sector. And we have, and I think I'm not the only one who has been slightly overtaken by events. I think that the Brexit vote and other things have consumed people and attention has moved. But the bottom line is that um, the internet is possibly the new frontier of human rights debate and it's probably your generation rather than mine that is going to have to sort it out. So to bring it back once more, and this is my last question about the Snoopers Charter, surely the fact that everybody knows your views on this and the fact that you've worked so tirelessly to prevent things like this make it even more probable and justifiable that you should speak out against it you know, when it's passing as a bill. What exactly are these protocols that well, were I was not. I was not you? in a position to make my maiden speech. There based are, on there rules are, in the House or based on personal no, sort no, of no, feelings? No, no, no. I, I think I've... There are... You have rules in this rather elegant chamber. There are rules in that rather elegant chamber too. Which are what? Which, about when, which are about when it is a pro, the, the kind of debate in which it's appropriate to make your maiden speech. And um, I am one person who is now affiliated to a party and to a chamber. Everybody knows what I think about the Snoopers Charter, and um, it's all out there. You can, you, can, you, you can Google it. You can have another go and try and be David Frost if you want, but I think I'd I'm take not my trying piece. to be David Frost, I'm just saying, you know, I think a lot of people here will be opposing that and would have been relying on you to say something in that moment. You go into politics from being, you know, something of an advocate and an activist to try and make a change. So it seems strange to people that you should be silent in the very moment that you've literally been working towards from the outside. I was not in a position to, to be an advocate in that house on that, on that bill. And, um, you know... Let's move on from that then. Um, so talking about taking sides, Labour are 13% 30 behind the Tories. Um, they've never ever before been so far behind whilst in opposition at this point in Parliament. Um, the opposition are normally ahead of government at this stage. Um, in fact, even under Michael Foote and the division of the 80s, um, they were closer to the Tories. Uh, is this a car crash opposition? And if it is, why are you a part of it? I think that your question which is presumably based on some polls that you googled or whatever. It's from an article in the New Statesman which was written yesterday. I think it's a very polarised world and um, people that base their values on polls are mistaken and people that base their predictions on polls it would seem are also mistaken. If we trusted polls, we would um, not be about to leave the European Union and Mr Trump would not be about to enter the White House. But in the end, it's values, not polls for me. And I've joined a Labour Party that is a pro-human rights Labour Party and not an authoritarian Labour Party. And I've, ch I've, 
I've affiliated at a time when racism, misogyny, hate crime, division, inequality, so many things that are bad in the world are on the rise. And I'm extremely comfortable with my choice because people are suffering, but they're being offered the wrong, the wrong antidote. And so some people want to divide and rule, and other people want to unite and govern. And I'm happy to, to lend a hand in that project. I mean, is it not precisely because of principle why those polls matter? Because it means that the most vulnerable people, the people you describe, are the ones going to be the most let down when, a gov when an opposition isn't doing its job. And you're, you're right, polls have proven us wrong, of course, in Brexit and with Trump. But this is unprecedented. This is a huge, huge margin of, of essential sort of predicted defeat. Well, um, you know what, and I'm, you can't just say polls. I'm obviously. not a career politician. Yeah. I'm a career human rights activist, and I've never based my um, decisions on polls. Um, I think that you, as a campaigner, when you when you look at polling, you want to change it, but you never make your you never make your value choice on the basis of polls. You you, you know you might change your messaging. You might. But the values have to stay, stay solid. And I've joined um, a party that has been in some difficulty, but I believe is now uniting and organising and is Her Majesty's opposition and is going to offer a lot of very, very vulnerable people real hope. And is it a party that can become Her Majesty's government? Yes, I believe so. On the basis that we've you know, been proven wrong with polls recently? No, not on the basis of being proven wrong with polls. You're, don't be obsessed with polls. I, I'm not being obsessed with polls, no, I'm, just, just, I'm just saying categorically. Polish people are lovely people, stop bashing them up, they're lovely people. No. The, <laughs> but it, it is I, a valid concern for any Labour Party polls, member. It's about saying, do we share values and can we come up with policies and messages that will unite people rather than divide people in this extraordinary moment, not just in Britain, but in Europe and on the planet. And it, I know it's not comfortable, and it hasn't been completely comfortable for me, but sometimes you have to pick a side. And I would pick Jeremy Corbyn's team over Nigel Farage or Donald Trump, or forgive me, even Theresa May's team, every day of the week and a month on Sunday, and that's what I've chosen to yeah, do. And I don't think I'm, I'm attacking you for that, I'm simply saying... What are you attacking me for, well, then? Well, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> I, wouldn't like, I wouldn't like to say I'm attacking you. I'm, 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 trying to understand, <laughs> well, I'm trying to understand where your hope lies in a Labour government that has these policies you describe as being so progressive, where your hope lies that they can actually put those policies in place because all of the evidence would suggest that they are going to lose, and badly. Well, we'll have to do some work then, won't we? Yeah, so, it's, I mean, what, what will that work be? Because you, it's not, this is not a flippant issue, as you described. These are people who are suffering, who need a progressive government, who need a government that care about state sector. Now, if that government can't get in, won't get in, because of the leadership, because of a failure to get support in Scotland and other areas, these people are left, and it's all very well saying we need to unite. But what are you going to do? What is Corbyn going to do? How are we going to see that 13% become 5%, become a 5% lead? I think that a lot of people will have had a wake-up call after the um, presidential election. And I think that I'm already feeling a much more united Labour Party. And by the way, divided parties tend not to, to be, you know, to be um, popular parties in terms of um, predictive voting. So I think that is something, you know, that's something out of adversity. But I also think that um, the left behind people of France, the UK, the US have been offered a very divisive, almost hateful, no, actually hateful option by people on the right. This is the moment for the people who say, yes, you've been left behind, but there's a different way to go. It's, it's a radical moment one way or another in politics. And I think that um, people are reflecting now, not least in the wake of Mr. Trump's victory. And, um, and I think we're going to be more united as a party, clearer in the messaging, but the values are absolutely solid. Okay, let's uh, talk about the Labour Party in a slightly different way. Your public relationship with the Labour Party 
um, coincided with you being invited to um, chair the inquiry into anti-Semitism. Do you regret announcing your allegiance and your membership to the party at the time when you took on that report? No, because the problem that I was asked to look at was a problem inside our party. And I thought it was quite important that people within the Labour Party, who, some of whom frankly needed to change their language, their conduct, their behaviour and their attitudes, um, knew that this was coming from the inside and not from the outside. It's too easy to um, diminish criticism as coming from the outside or from someone who is politically suspect and um, and and um, and I I had finished my cross-party non-party job I was going to join anyway I was asked to do this and my view is change has to come from within so so that that was my position and and I think that remain you know despite all the whatever slings and arrows that remains my position um, the Labour Party is part of the country, it's part of society, so it, it shares some of the, um, it's bound to, to share some of the bigotry and some of the problems that the wider country has, but it, it claims for itself the title of, of being the party of equality and human rights and therefore it has to be judged by higher standards. And um, that's, what I, that's what I attempted to do in that report. So I think a lot of the slings and arrows you describe come from a rejection to this point that it's about something within the Labour Party. Most people who were affected by that were not necessarily in the Labour Party. They were a Jewish population in this country. So really, it sounds like you're just misprioritising who this is about. It's not just about ensuring people within Labour trust your report. It's about ensuring Jewish people in this country feel like an anti-Semitism inquiry is being handled sufficiently. I, 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 take, I take your point, yeah. but I was not um, appointed by a Prime Minister to do a judicial inquiry into the country. I was hired by the leader of the Labour Party to sort out issues in the Labour Party. And I think it was brave of him to do it, and it was important for, for, for our part. And you can only you can only work within your jurisdiction, if I can put it like that. And, um, and that was the project, and that remains the project. And, and by the way, I don't believe that Labour is so much worse than any other party, or, but I'm not getting into the competition for yeah, that. It's, it's no, there's no I, oppression poker. I'm just asking about the Labour Party because you're in the I Labour was party. asked to, to, to help deal with this challenge within the Labour Party yeah. and I believed that the way to tackle that challenge in the Labour Party was from within. I was already sympathetic, I was already proposing to join and I thought that the way to convince people, to some people, to change their language, their conduct and behaviour is to say, come on, we're in this together, this is not the way that a person of the Labour Party or of the left who believes in equality and human rights should behave. OK, so the sort of outcome of, the, of that report, and I'm going to quote it directly, is um, the Labour Party is not overrun by anti-Semitism. Why the phrase overrun? Is that not an extremely high bar to set? Surely it should be there is not a problem of anti-Semitism. There is no anti-Semitism, not overrun. I wouldn't want to be inside a party that is just a little bit overrun. But why set the bar so high? Well, it's not, is it? Because if you read the rest of that sentence, or dare I say it, Noah, you're clearly a very busy young man. If you read the rest of the report, you will see that I said, we're not overrun, but we've got some problems, and here yeah, they no. all are. Yeah. So I'm saying to my fellow Labour Party members, there's some work to do here. And, and I'm saying it in a moment when I know that to some extent the debate is... is um, weaponized is is you know people within any political party and i've been learning this in recent times as a new member of a political party will hunker down and say every criticism is coming from outside every criticism is coming from an opponent okay because that's what people do when they when there's a civil war or a war going on 
what I want to say to them, no, no, you're not terrible people. This is not a terrible party. And, and, and that's true, by the way. But we need to look at ourselves in the mirror. So the party is not overrun by anti-Semitism. But everything else, you've, you've done, um, forgive me, no, but you've just quoted the first line of a report that goes on from, for and some considerable, I can talk about more of the some considerable like. pages. Yeah. But everything that follows that sentence is critique of the ways in which the party can do better, must do better, must improve in language, conduct and, um, and procedure. Okay, and if you also read the rest of the report, you'll see a sort of neglect of a lot of the issues that were here in Oxford. Um, Baroness Royale obviously conducted something into that. Um, why did you sort of omit to comment on, on things that had happened here in the Oxford University Labour Council? Well, Jan Royal, my colleague, Baroness Royal, did the project on the Oxford Labour Club and her work is now in the public domain and I benefited a great deal from her understanding of campus life but you'll forgive me I know it's, it's lovely when one sits here to think that this is the world but the world is bigger even than this place and the Labour Party and the country is bigger even than this place so I think we learnt a lot from I, I felt that I learnt a lot from conversations with her about, um, about internet abuse about the student experience but it's but in, in the case of my report it wasn't just about Oxford it was about the it was about the broader party so there was no and the other thing to say is that I had no disciplinary jurisdiction okay I and and and, and people who are pending discipline in the party will be dealt with by the appropriate structures what I was trying to do and what I still want to do is to change the culture and the climate and the, the procedure of, of the party. Individual cases will be dealt with in the appropriate yeah, manner. I mean, I'm very aware the world is bigger than Oxford, and precisely because it was meant to be a broad re report, it should have obviously included Oxford. I don't see why, you know, y your argument is that it's broad and therefore it should, it should exclude something. That's self-defeating. The point is, it should include everything, particularly when a world-leading university has, you know, no. serious issues in it. I just don't understand why well, you're No university it. was mentioned by name in my report, I suspect. I think you, you, you're, the, you're the scholar of my report, so you... So Why no, so defensive? <laughs> no, no university was mentioned by name in my report, and, I, and I've also been criticised in some quarters for not naming individuals who are pending discipline as well. That's because they have... They're, they're entitled to their due process. What we're trying to do is to talk about cultures and behaviours that are actually applicable, whether, they have, whether they're here or whether on another campus. Um, my understanding is that some of the issues that arose here arose on campuses around the country. There was no need in my broader thematic report to pick on this campus or that campus or this individual or that individual. What we needed to, what we needed to isolate and articulate was the kind of language and behaviour that is unacceptable anywhere in pretty clear terms so that the party can then take you know the, the, the conclusions of the report that are numbered sort of 1 to 30 and implement them and not get upset about whether it's Oxford or Cambridge or anywhere else and just go this you are not allowed to describe people in this way you are not allowed to treat people in this way anywhere and it's not a sort of narrative about uh, or a judgment, by the way, on any particular campus or any particular individual. That's for others, and, and, and that's for party discipline. But it's a template about what is and is not acceptable behaviour in the party that is supposed to be the party of social democracy and human rights. Um, I'd like to go back to something you were talking about earlier, which is the weaponisation of sort of uh, narrative in politics. Now, you seem to be setting up this dichotomy of your Labour Party, people who subscribe to the outcome of your report and sort of Theresa May's cabinet. I'm not talking about critics in the Conservatives, I'm talking about critics who are Jewish, who are members of the Labour Party, who are members of Oxford University Labour Council. Are they weaponising this? Um, not in my experience, but... but um no, no, not in, not in my experience, but the, po the, the point I was trying to make earlier is 
that one of the reasons for very publicly joining the party is so that people who felt uncomfortable about some of my criticisms wouldn't say, well, you're, you're a closet Tory, aren't you? You're, a, you know, you're, you're doing this from the... Because we do know that in party politics, in Parliament and elsewhere, people are understandably going to play on the weaknesses on the other side. That's, that's fair but enough. Why should you pander to that? I mean, Owen Jones gets called a closet Tory every well, day. I, it, because if you're trying to check... OK, I'm not pandering to anything. I am a proud member of the Labour Party. It is the party that has passed every piece of equality law that this country has ever seen. I was trying and continue to try to get members of the Labour Party to come together and lift their heads and be their best selves. And if they can't do that, I have suggested a disciplinary process that will mean that some of them will no longer be members of the party. OK, and now my last question about the report, um, relating to your peerage. Now, yeah, it's 25 past. Um, you've said over and again that you were offered your peerage after, after you'd completed the report, and l let's take that to be true, uh, as I'm sure it is. No, I'm being serious. <laughs> I'm, I, I mean that seriously. Um, do you still not understand, though, why there would be such a degree of discomfort, of mistrust, of resentment within... The Jewish community, even if it was the case, you know, that you'd accepted the peerage afterwards, do you not empathise with the degree of dissatisfaction, particularly when the leading group, the, the Board of Deputies, has described that report as a whitewash, when the CST have described it as, as basically being a joke, when the Chief Rabbi, you know, all the possible sort of zones of Jewish leadership have criticised that report, and then for you to accept the peerage on its publication, do you not empathise with the degree of frustration there? I think we disagree about this now, and I think I've said um, everything that I want to say about this. I am, I'm not in the business of, of lashing out at people who, um, who question my good faith. I think I, I think I will leave it where it is. OK, thanks. Uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Uh, anyone got any questions? Yep, front row there. Could you wait for the microphone to get to you? Um, given the difficulties the government is having over um, our exit from the EU, do you think there should be a second referendum on the terms of Brexit? I don't think there should be... A, I, I'm wary of suggesting a second referendum because I don't want to be someone who... And, and by the way, I campaigned to remain. In, I, I campaigned to remain in, in, in the EU. And like a lot of people, I was quite upset by the result. But I, I am a Democrat, and I don't find it easy to say I didn't like the result. And so I want to, you know, to turn the, the board over and, and, and start again. But what I do think is that um, so many of the most vociferous advocates for Brexit said um, they were going to restore sovereignty and they talked a lot about parliamentary sovereignty and the sovereignty of our courts. And so they should not resist the, the sovereignty of parliament or of our courts. And I think that it's, it's within our system and it's within our constitution to ask the government to present its plan. And all this, we're not going to give a running commentary, etc. There's no commentary at all. And we're allowed to suspect that there is no commentary because there is no plan. And they are negotiating on our behalf. And so we're entitled to say to our, our advocates, Can you, we want to give you instructions, we, or at least we want to know what the plan is. Don't just go off in secret and then tell us in a few years' time that this is how we're going to live in every sphere of our lives. So, so no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not advocating a second referendum, but I am advocating a lot more leadership and transparency and accountability to, to Parliament about what the, what, what the government's vision is about how we are all going to live with our, with our neighbours and, and the world. Thanks. Another question? There's a hand at the back there. Thank you very much. You said that Labour's great strength 
was that it shared the values of Britain's working class. And yet 50% of Labour porters uh, Labour supporters who vo voted for Brexit said that they are not going to vote for the party again. 68% of former working class figures who were former members of the Labour Party say that they support Theresa May's grammar school reforms. The Labour Party itself has said that they would not offer a higher cap on immigration and furthermore factions within the party say that they would advocate a second referendum. It seems fairly clear that certain segments of the Labour Party are significantly out of touch with working class values. So my question is what is the future of the Labour Party if it no longer represents the labourer? Well, I don't think I claimed to speak on behalf of the, the working class, but, but, but maybe I don't remember what, what I said. Um, what I think I said, what I, what I know I said actually, is that this is the party that claims to be a party of equality and human rights, and that's why I joined it. <coughs> and what I would also say is that clearly we are experiencing a, experiencing a moment in Britain and Europe and the world where a lot of people feel incredibly alienated and left behind um, by politics and economics and their experience in recent years and I can sort of hear it in your voice um, but that's not a question about the future of the Labour Party, that is a bigger question about the future of our planet. And for me, the answer has to be a more equal planet, not a more divisive one. And to put it really bluntly to you, sir, Mr Trump and Mr Farage and Ms Le Pen and others are just playing the oldest game in the book, and it's called Divide and Rule. People are unhappy, people are left out, people are dissatisfied. Teach them to hate each other and suspect each other on the basis of race or nationality or religion or sex or whatever it is that is the badge of difference. And, and, and the job of not just the Labour Party but anybody who believes in human rights and democracy and a more equal world, our job is to say there's another way. You have been left behind. You have been left out. You have not benefited from globalisation in the way that some people have. But we won't divide and rule. We will unite and govern. And we'll do it around democratic values and human rights. And we're not going to just have internationalism for the rich people on their super, super jets in the first class lounges. We're going to have internationalism for ordinary people. And their wages don't have to be undercut and their human rights can be protected and we can, we can come together. And that is, that's what I believe. Thank you for that one clap. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, my question is about Ken Livingstone. Um, as we all know, he was suspended from the Labour Party for his comments over um, that picture that now Shah showed on the internet um, and his suggestion that Hitler was a Zionist. Um, is he the example of the, the sorts of problems that you can see within the Labour Party? Was it right that he was suspended, do you think? Um, very short answer. I believe that Mr Livingstone is, is, is still pending a disciplinary hearing so um, b before the Labour Party. I, I, understand your, I understand the reason for your question because time marches on but um, but um, you must address your question to, to, the, to the General Secretary of the Labour Party and, uh, and a disciplinary process. You, you can appreciate my difficulty because if I um, criticise, it's, it's a bit like the discussion we had earlier, Noah. Mm. If I name individuals or indeed Labour clubs in a report that is supposed to be about setting you know, the culture and the tone and the code and the behaviour, and I just name people, and, and, and I'm, not the, I'm not the tribunal and I'm not the judge, but I just make my personal views known, then they get to go before the tribunal and say, how can I possibly get a fair hearing now? Right? Whether it's a particular Labour club or a particular individual, and well, Chakrabarti's been running around saying that I'm X, Y, or Z. That's... That's the predicament. Lots of people have been running around saying he's X, Y, Z, though. I'm sorry? Lots of people have been running around. I know, but not, 
but not... Well, I'm now the Shadow Attorney General, and before I was writing this report, and people do things that I don't approve of. You know, people behave in ways that... Are, so, so on the one hand, um, I'm, if, if you actually take the trouble to read my report, and by the way, lots of people don't, because it's like 30 pages long and it's like, you know, really boring, but, but, but a lot of people are very quick to criticise and don't actually read it. And, and if you don't have time, just read the recommendations in the conclusion, because they're like two pages and they're numbered and it's like really simple in a way. Um, and some people said, well, they're so simple. I'm like, yeah, but decency, common decency is quite simple in the end. But anyway, um, I think that um, it was about getting those principles implemented. And I, that, that I wasn't sitting in judgment over these particular cases. Those cases, in my view, need to get on and happen. But those people do need to have a fair hearing. So we want no racism, no misogyny, no bad behaviour of the kind that I actually described in my report. But people should also have due process um, b b before they get disciplined or whatever in the party. Yeah. And I think, just to pick up on that very quickly, um, well, I completely respect that you can't you know, say a verdict before it's been before due process as to whether you think he is a whatever or not a whatever. Um, I think you might be in a position to say whether you agree or not that he was suspended, given that was a position made by your leader, a decision made by your leader. Do you agree with the suspension? Um, it's not for me to... I mean, yes, I agree with the suspension. I mean, it, you know, um, but, but I don't want to... Under, you know, do you know what? I don't think you really want me to undermine this due process. No, I, I don't. I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't you asking know, you about it, the verdict. It, it, I was asking about whether you agree with the suspension, because that was a gentleman's question. I think... I, I th well, yeah. I think that there's a case to answer. Yeah. Let's, put it, let's put it like that. And I think that um, this should not linger... I think this, I, I, if I'll say one new thing, I don't think justice delayed is not a good thing either. And nobody should have these things hanging over for too long. And it's not in the interests of, of any individual or of the party or of any institution, right, to, you know, to leave these things pending for too long. So I hope that that will be dealt with. Uh, let's go to the second row there. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have um, a question. What is uh, your opinion on the human rights issues within Turkey? And do you think that Western democracies should somehow intervene into the Turkish political conflict? Thank you. Goodness, there are no easy questions this evening, are there? I am. Um I think that we've all been very um, anxious and upset about some of the issues in, in Turkey in recent months. And I, I'm almost sort of grateful to you for reminding me because literally a few months ago, this was all over the newspapers in Britain. It was something that we were all in the human rights community in Britain, we were all talking about. And then the circus moves on. And now we're dealing with our own concerns, Brexit, the US, and so on. And, but I, I, I think you've got a real point. This, this country on the, on the cusp of East and West, on the cusp of Europe, that so many people invested so much hope in, and, um, and the, the post-coup the post behaviour and the crackdowns, so hugely concerning but I think the problem the challenge that we face is it's not just one or two countries in this moment now do you, do, do you see my point I I want to give you a wonderful polished answer but in my head and in my heart I'm thinking what the what do I know about keeping democracy alive in Britain or France or the US let alone in Turkey that I've never been to so I feel that there's something going on in this moment that is not even country specific, that we all have to, we all have to realise and, and capture. And I include myself in that. I think we've been complacent for too long. 
not just about democracy and human rights, but almost about civilization itself. It's such a fragile thing. And do you know what? I don't think that it's very easy for someone in Britain or the US or elsewhere in Western Europe right now to, to, you know, to give big lectures about human rights when hate crimes have spiked and Donald Trump is, is heading for the White House, etc., etc. But, but, but you're right, we are, we are very concerned about the situation in Turkey. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, let's go to the front row there. Um, thank you. Um, with this like, increasing division and hate that's emerging in this changing like, political and social world, and you're talking about uniting and coming together, which I completely agree with, could you, how, how can we do that on like, an individual level and um, governments? How should we go about starting to try and increase connections? Thank you. How do we... How do you combat the discourse of hate? I mean, pff, enormous question, but it, beling it, it begins in simple steps in a way. And I think one of the things that I like about this, this place, and sometimes when I've been here over more than a decade, I've been, you know, wearing a posh dress and sitting over there or over there, and it's all a bit theatrical, and sometimes it's been more like this. But on all of the occasions that I've been here, there's a, there's a sort of civility, of, if I can put it like that, there's a sort of listening, there's a sort of politeness that is where we begin. And I think that it's partly the political moment, it's partly the technology. We kind of, there are a lot of people and a lot of places in the world that have forgotten, and in, in our own country too, that have forgotten the benefit of, of listening and even disagreeing well. So I would argue that in your own life, in your tutorial, in your family, we've got families now that are divided over Brexit, divided over politics. We've got, we had a, people talking about the Labour Party, for example, we've had our own disputes in the Labour Party that have not been handled with kindness and civility, with or without the, you know, the added questions we discussed before. We have to learn to, 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 to be kind and polite and to disagree well in the intimate sphere as well as in the community sphere as well as in the national sphere. And that may sound like Mary Poppins to you, but I believe it with all my heart and start with that just basic level of human empathy and civility, and then we can, we can take it from there. Yes, uh, you're just behind you. Just hand the mic over, thanks. Hi, this kind of follows on from that question. Um, I really agree with what you said about um, how change is best coming from within, um, and this idea of getting into that kind of setting in communities in Britain which are overrun with this, well, maybe not overrun, but experience a high level of this kind of hatred, um, what sort of force do you see within that that can do what you're talking about? Because it might not be practical to get them into a setting like this. Well, um, it's not, it's funny, isn't it? Why is it not practical to get people in a conversation like, okay, it's not going to be this beautiful Oxford Union, but, but, but actually, you can get people together. So um, on Saturday, I was in Margate at the Turner Contemporary, a beautiful cultural space. And um, it's in Kent. Well, you know where Margate is. It's in Kent, it's on the coast. Um, there are a lot of UKIP voters. There are lots of, you know, issues. And um, I was there for the opening of a, of a beautiful new contemporary art exhibit. And they've got this thing called the Studio Group, and they're a group of <laughs> local people who were empowered by that <coughs> cultural space to commission their own artist. And they took applications, they commissioned, they were you know, sponsored by the Art Council and other funders to commission an artist. They commissioned a young man from Nottingham 
to, to, to lead them in their artistic endeavour. But it wasn't just artistic, it was a community endeavour. And he, uh, and they built this beautiful exhibit with textiles that was about East meets West and people collaborating. Right. The, the locals were knitting and sewing and spinning and he comes from Nottingham, and his mother's, he's, he's, he's an Asian young man from Nottingham, his mother was a tailor. And what they did, they spent 18 months being together and talking together, and you should go and see it if, you, if, you, if you're in Kent or you can get to Margaret. This beautiful, optimistic, cultural thing. But it's not even about the thing, it's about bringing people together in a, in a place where they wouldn't otherwise meet each other and talk to each other. And it doesn't have to just be the Oxford Union, there are other places like this. It's not all so beautiful and all so grand, but, but beautiful in their own ways. There are public spaces, some of them are libraries, some of them are museums, some of them are schools, some of them are universities. They need to be heated and funded and supported and people need to be given the opportunity to, to, to come together and learn from each other because otherwise it's divide and rule every way. I feel that like the places you've just like talked about are still quite middle class um, and it's kind of from my experience from where I'm from and the issues I faced in doing human rights work where I'm from um, it's people who would feel uncomfortable in those environments who like would benefit most I think from that kind of civilized discussion but would feel would feel uncomfortable and would never be motivated to attend that sort of space um, well sometimes we've got to do it frankly sometimes we have to do it on demonstrations and I mean it, it's really about um how, what can I say to you for me you know you're you're you, you've got your whole life ahead of you and you're going to do amazing things, and I'm a bit further down the track. Um, for me, I suppose in my life I've learned that what gives it meaning for me is other people. And in the intimate sphere, we call it um, family, friendship, love, whatever you want to call it. And in the bigger community sphere, we call it community, solidarity, whatever. And we've just got to find any available space to bring people together and you're right there are it, it's easier if you've got the benefit of a higher education if you've got the better of a ticket to the cultural space to the Oxford Union which I think it costs 200 quid or you know it, but but we've got to make sure that we provide these spaces for people to come together and if they don't happen by themselves we've got to fund them and sometimes it's being a member of a trade union, sometimes it's being um, involved in your, you know, in your local community group. Sometimes it comes out of protest, actually, to be honest. But whatever it takes to, 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 to bring people together. Some people are currently being brought together in hate. In, and we've got to make sure if we're on, I'm not talking about party politics now, I'm talking about democracy itself. Those of us who are Democrats and vaguely believe in human rights and the rule of law need to bring people together in, 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 in an environment that's not about hating people on the outside. I just want to pick up on that very quickly because I feel that there, there's been a theme of unity and, and coming together in a time of sort of division. Um, how politically or, or otherwise can the message be effectively communicated when there's such a cacophony of, of xenophobia and hatred and division and sort of nativism? What political means, what narratives need to be expressed in order for people actually to hear what you're saying? Because as you said, you know, it's where we're saying it here or, you know, in Margate at the art gallery, but a lot of people aren't hearing it. What needs to be done for people to hear it? Well, you know, in a, in a way, Noah, you're the future and I'm the past. You know, you got yourself elected. I've never been elected to anything in my life. You got elected to be president of the union. You know, um, and I think what's partly challenging um, is the social media environment, which, by the way, I think is a wonderful, empowering thing. 
It's a wonderful democratising thing, but it can also be a place where people just think out loud. Some of the stuff that I read, and frankly for my report, some of the stuff that I, I read that people are prepared to say online, anonymously or semi-anonymously, they would never say to somebody's face. You know, you and, you and I are sitting here having a conversation, but, um, and I make some silly joke and it hurts your feelings. Even if you don't say that really hurt my feelings, I will, I will see it in your face. But if I'm very brave online, I will just learn to, you know, the gap between the thought and the word and the effect in this new media environment is, is very, very small. So, so on the one hand, the internet has been like the printing press in terms of democratisation, but it's also given people, you know, the, the, the equivalent power to, to... So I suspect that it's probably more your generation than mine that is going to answer this question about one, how those of us who believe in equality and human rights are going to make the most of this, but two, what is the appropriate way of regulating this, this new continent of the globe? And not censoring it, not, um, not diminishing it, but, but, um, but learning the new kindness, the new etiquette, the new grammar of this space so that it doesn't become a horrible place to be a woman, a horrible place to be a minority because you're just going to get hated on online. You know, I've experienced it and a, a lot of other people have too. Thanks. Uh, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, let's go, we'll go to you and then we'll go to the hand at the back there, but starting with the checks on the left. Hi. Um, you said earlier that you were a very, that you opposed a second referendum based on grounds of democracy, and you're obviously a very staunch defender of democracy. Um, as a staunch defender of democracy, what is your opinion on unelected second chambers, and specifically members of government and opposition being un unelected? Um, indeed. Um, so when I was an undergraduate, um, studying constitutional law, we would occasionally be given an, an, an essay to write back. Can, can you justify an unelected second chamber? And, you know, sometimes you'd write no, and if you wanted to be elegant, you might write hell no, or something like that. So, so here's the thing. We have this, this system in the UK that you couldn't make up, that you would never make up. And we've got it because it's evolved and we haven't had a revolution in a very long time. And so what, we, what we've got is an unwritten constitution. We've got a Supreme Court that doesn't have strike-down powers. Right, the US Supreme Court, the French Constitutional Court, the, you know, the, 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 these, these other courts all over the democratic world are the referees of the constitution that they have, right? So when the elected bits of the constitution say a pass a, you know, an outrageous unconstitutional um, piece of legislation, the referees, the Supreme Court can say, nope, against the rules of the constitution, written constitution, Grund norm, whatever it is, strike it down. We don't have that. So we have this kind of thing that's evolved because we haven't had a revolution in a very long time. No written constitutional in one place anyway. No um, Supreme Court with strike-down powers. So the Supreme Court, under the Human Rights Act, forget the, the EU thing is a whole other conversation now, for obvious reasons, but under the Human Rights Act, which mercifully still remains and we must protect it, um, if the Supreme Court says that an Act of Parliament is contrary to human rights, all it can do is pass a declaration of incompatibility and say, please think again and then we rely on Parliament to think again, but it does or it doesn't. So the judges don't even have the final word as, as, as referees, and they are independent components in the Constitution. The House of Lords are arguably, I mean, we know it's anachronistic, and it's this, and it's that, and it's unelected, and it's appointed, and all the rest of it, 
but there is an independence that comes there. And again, they can't strike anything down either. So the, the, you know, the, the chamber that I'm sitting in now ultimately can't frustrate the will of the House of Commons. It can do what the judges can do, which is to say, slow down, think again. So the House of Lords Legislative Chamber, just like the Supreme Court, can the day after a terrible murder or a terrible atrocity stop the death penalty being introduced overnight. Not forever, but can ask people to calm down and think again. And I'm not making this argument for it because I'm sitting in it. You can have a giggle and say I am. I, I, I've spoken and written about this a lot over the years. You wouldn't design a constitution like this if we had just had a civil war, God forbid, or we'd, you know, we'd just been liberated in the way that all these Commonwealth countries did. But this is how it's evolved, and it has its checks and balances. And all I would say is get rid of it. If you, if you want to get rid of the House of Lords, get rid of the House of Lords. But goodness me, put some protections in its place. And the, the protection that I would demand or request is that, our supreme, is that we have a written constitution and a Supreme Court that are independent ref referees that can compensate for all these independent-minded peers who don't have to seek re-election, that can, you know, be ballast when it's 42 days, ID cards, torture, and so on. Thanks. I'll just take one more question. I think I said I'd go to you at the back there. Hi, I just wanted to look towards your experience as a human rights activist. Um, I think we're sort of increasingly living in a generation, particularly in relation to our right to privacy, that we just don't care anymore. And I think what I wanted to know is how you feel our generation should react in restoring our understanding of the law and our desire to understand the law and uphold it. Thank you. Um, I don't think you don't care anymore, you know? I, I, that's not my experience of your generation, and please don't tell me that it is, because otherwise I'm going to give up. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm investing all my hope in your generation, and you're here, and you asked that question, and so that can't be completely true. Um, I agree with you that the new cool technology, which, by the way, I indulge in, right? I've got a phone in my bag that will tell the world and his wife where I am and it's and that his phone is two minutes away and where the nearest pizza is coming from and you know it's cool technology and it suits our convenience but there's a dark side and I don't think it's that we don't care or that you don't care I just think it's that we haven't caught up with the technology yet I kind of agree with the gist of your question that I think that the internet and, and surveillance and the internet of things and you know it's the new horizon, it's the new frontier for human rights debate, I agree with that. I don't believe that people don't care, I just think that we haven't woken up, caught up yet. So the technology moves apace and the ethics and the politics and the law have not caught up. And this probably happens many times before in human history. I'm thinking, I keep saying the printing press, but no doubt other technologies too. It's going to be your generation that's going to have to catch up so that we find a new ethics, a new politics, a new law that, that regulates this space. And you know what it's going to take? It's going to take um, people who it's going to take multidisciplinary debate. It's going to take places like this, in a way, and others, where people who are um, lawyers, but but also technologists and philosophers and whatever, come come together, and and not just in debate, but in genuine, in a spirit of genuine learning and discussion, because the, the you know. The, the lawyers and the ethicists need to better understand the technology, but the technologists need to have the confidence in, the, in their politics and their ethics and their law so that they can start thinking about how we would design in the, 
you know, the privacy and the sensitivity, and it's not just always designed out. And it's, it's an enormous challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity, and, it's, um, and I think it's an opportunity for, for your generation and, and the Academy and great places like this and, and, and others. It's, 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 I would almost say it's the, it's, it's the challenge, one of the big challenges of, of your generation, and... Um, I wish you well with it. And just a final question relating to that and sort of brings us full circle as to what you were speaking about about a year ago. I suppose the other side of the coin of state surveillance is state obfuscation of immoral acts um, that are obfuscated via technology. Um, and we've seen this in the American election with uh, the FBI reports and, the Wik and WikiLeaks. Do you think there's room for sort of citizen leaks of, uh, of government sort of action. Do you think that, say, is justifiable on the basis of openness or is that reprehensible? Um, I think that when a citizen chooses to um, break the law, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've, I've respected confidences all my life, actually, and I still do, right? Because it's part of being a lawyer and a civil servant and so on. Um, if you choose to breach a relationship of trust and confidence or breach the law, it's a massive decision. It's one of the biggest decisions that an individual should ever make. And I can conceive of moments when an ethical individual would choose to break the law. We can do the thought experiment, right? You're in a fascist state and you're breaking the law to save lives, right? But when you ch make that decision, to, to break the law or to break a trust or a confidence. Goodness me, your moral dilemmas don't end, they just begin. And so I think that there have been, you know, we, we don't have time now, but I think there are ethical and unethical leaks. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that there, there's showboating and there's leaking and there's whatever. And I don't believe in absolute transparency. How can I? Because I believe in personal privacy. And if you just, if everybody lives in a panopticon um, and you leak everything on every government database, for example, then a lot of individual people are going to be unsafe and lose their privacy and their banking security and so on. But equally, there is, you know, there is a role for a genuine ethical whistleblower who makes a targeted, proportionate leak and, 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 and faces personal jeopardy for doing it. It's, it's, an old, it's one of those ultimate questions, but what I would say is you don't do it, you don't do it lightly and you don't do it on an industrial scale, just like you don't put people under surveillance on an industrial scale. Okay, great. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Please remain seated whilst we leave, but first join me in thanking Brandis Chakrabarti for her visit. <laughs>